G'day expats and welcome to another episode of Expat Chat, episode 97 today. And no, you're not joined by Ed or anyone from the US, it's Brett, I'm back. Um, joined today by my <laughs> mate and colleague, Mr. James Ridley, who's the Managing Director for the Asia Pacific Region. G'day mate. G'day Brett, I should say good morning Brett. Um, and it those is. who are uh, tuning in today and listening into today's episode, as always, joined by friend and colleague Brett Evans, the Founding and Managing Director for the EMEA Region. So the Atlas Wealth Group, mate. How is the sand pit treating you today? Right, well, we'll hear that um, people have come back from summer holidays full of uh, vim and vigor, and a lot of activity. A lot of folks moving into the region, both uh, yep. the Gulf region as well as uh, well as Europe. Everyone's moving, um, and it's not just for work. And that's what we wanted to talk about today was actually yes. people looking at retiring overseas. So that's both yes. existing expats who aren't going back to Australia, but also to people who lived and worked in Australia their whole life who are looking at um, spending the uh, uh, the twilight years in a foreign climate. So, mate, without yes. further ado, let's get the show on the road. Quick disclaimer, all the information that we're about to talk about today should be treated as informational and educational purposes only. If you do need to get personal advice, which is this is not, please reach out to a specialist like Atlas. Sounds good, mate. Now, jumping into it, I guess the main topic which we should be delving into is you know i guess how pensions in australia are treated when you are retiring or residing in another country i agree with you there's definitely been a big push for a lot of these golden visas and retirement visas around the world in the last probably three or four years um and i think the common question or denominator that i often get when a client tells me hey i'm going to look at actually retiring in thailand or i'm going to stay in singapore or i'm actually thinking about staying in Hong Kong or the US or wherever it might be, how's my pension or how's my super fund going to be treated when I commence that into an account-based pension? So really good topic. Yeah, mate, and I think it's what we find is there's different people moving to or retiring in different regions for different timeframes, different reasons. You know, mm. there's a massive fraternity of Aussies retiring in France. They're there for five or 10 years and then they go back to Australia as opposed to, say, someone retiring in the UK that tends to be because of family ties, whether there's a dual nationality, you know, member of, of a of a partnership or a marriage, you know, with That's local it. family. They're there permanently. And the same in your case, obviously in the US. You know, that's normally why you don't tend – U.S. is not really a retirement destination. It's, you're there because of family ties and that sort of stuff. But then there's, that's it. That, then there's yep. Thailand, and you'd go in there for lifestyle like France. So a yep. lot to cover off on, and, and and I think we'll run through sort of the, the cliff notes in terms of – because we could talk for hours on this, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just sort of the different nuances, because I think what people forget is they understand the superannuation laws in Australia – as Australian tax resident very well, but they don't understand the other side, you know, what we call two-dimensional yeah. advice, how the other country, the resident country you're moving to, taxes any income coming in and how that's treated. So, mate, let's get the show on the road. Do you want to kick off uh, with – we'll go around the world. We'll start in the US. Yeah, well, I mean, a quick reminder. So, you know, back in Australia when you've got an ordinary Australian super fund and you've been growing it up until when you retire and then you convert it into a full account-based pension, in Australia, it's completely tax-free. So that's a really important one. The investment earnings are tax-free within the account. You're getting all your franking credits fully refunded to you, which is just amazing. And then on top of that, you do not need to declare the income to the HO when you're an ordinary Australian tax resident. So that's a really important one. And that's why I really do believe superannuation, especially when you convert it to an account-based pension, is the be-all when it comes to pensions around the world, when you can stack them all up and, I suppose, make a comparison from a tax aspect, uh, as well as just, you know, obviously getting those investment earnings, squeezing as much juice out of them because of the franking credits refunds. The US, now within the tax treaty, between the US and Australia, there is actually no carve out for what's considered, I suppose, private pensions or superannuation funds. There's carve outs for social security and say the age pension, uh, which is great. But on the other side, there is no carve out for say an Australian super fund or maybe a 401k, an IRA, those sort of things. Quick shout out to our previous episode. If you want to know more about US retirement accounts, jump into that one with Ed. But when we look at how it's treated and taxed by the IRS, it is actually taxed. It, you know, it's treated as foreign sourced income. 
because on the Australian side, it's tax free. There is actually no franking credit or I guess foreign tax credit, I should say, that you can take across and use on the US side. So then you're paying a little bit of tax each calendar year or US tax year on that foreign sourced income when you are a US tax resident. I think the issue commonly arises for those which are dual nationals. And I'm, 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 I'm deep diving in a little bit, but you can usually use what's called the foreign earned income exclusion as one category, or the other category is the foreign tax credit system. But neither of those benefit you when you are drawing down a tax-free pension from Australia. There is no credit or tax credit to use. So that's a, a really quick summary on how they're treated in the US. Okay, well, let's move on to the UK. So in the UK, it's very different. Surprise, surprise, as all countries are. <laughs> and because the UK is sort of, I wouldn't say it's got a backward system, to com it's, it's the reverse to Australia. So Australian yep. super schemes, they're taxed in accumulation and untaxed in, in pension phase. In the UK, they're untaxed in accumulation and then taxed in pension phase. So when you flip that switch and turn on the allocated pension or account-based pension being a tax resident in the UK, you're actually taxed on that income. And what it, what it comes down to is the DTA between Australia and the UK specifically says that if the, the home country, Australia, taxes you on it, the UK won't. But if Australia doesn't tax you on it, the UK will. So while it's good on this side, it's bad on this side. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's different ways. There's remittance basis. There's income basis. There's a lot of different ways that HMRC pulls this apart. So some clients say, well, if I just draw it down as a lump sum, can I do that as opposed to a drip feed? And unfortunately not. They, they've thought of that. They're clever chickens. They've got ahead of you on the curve there and they'll get you both sides. So, yeah. and that sort of leans me into the French side. So the French yeah. are very similar. So in France, they've got, you know, a income declaration, which is worldwide, no different to most other countries. Um, and then you've got these social charges, these, uh, and now everyone who's in France has got to absolutely cringe when I say this word. I can never say it. It's the prelevetments uh, socio, which is like a social charge that also applies to your foreign income. So what that means is your income will come through and they'll say, bang, we need to charge you on that, which is like a form of income tax. Um, yeah. Italy, this one's an interesting one. So Italy <laughs> depends on the region you're in. I've spoken to 10 different accountants in Italy in all different regions and they all have a different response. So generally speaking, there's a discussion that there might be a 10% tax on foreign income, 25% uh, tax on foreign income. It depends whether you're <laughs> registered in the local jurisdiction and how that person, whether they wake up on the left side of the bed or the right side of the bed, um, tax decides to tax you on that. Some don't, some do. So it is a very confusing one there. And, and that's, you know, just those three countries alone, you know, just show mm. the same principles, but different tax yeah. rates, obviously. And that's what I was going to say to you, Brett. I mean, when you think about, um, I guess, different regions, you know, we talk about Europe and then, you know, you've got the US and the Asia Pacific region or the Americas. The theme that I, I reckon is prevalent is the fact that throughout Europe and a lot of the European countries, if you're residing there, but you're pulling in a foreign pension, I would say that there is going to be some sort of tax generally uh, levied on it, depending especially also the visa that you're on. But I don't know, just the different countries I've seen over there, there's usually going to be something, you know, not saying it's going to be huge, but there's usually going to be something. And then you look at the Middle East, well, that's pretty clean cut. You know, you most of them are all tax-free countries uh, and therefore you're not going to really have an issue there. Um, you look at the US, yep, it's definitely taxed. Canada, same, it is taxed. Um, and then if you go sort of throughout Southeast Asia, a lot of them, I would say, don't, but there are some that do if you're bringing it into the country. If you keep it out of the country and you're using, say, a card that, and it's a kept out of the actual domicile, then it's not. So I would say that's a, probably a general good theme to follow. Um, I've spoken to some expats where they're like, listen, I don't want to be taxed anywhere when I'm in retirement. To say, well, that's generally not possible unless you've got everything in super and you're going to stay in Australia. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and I guess that's probably the common theme that I would follow. Um, usually European countries will have to levy some sort of tax on a foreign pension. That's normal. And I know European countries, and Brett, I know you know this, some of the estate taxes over there can be pretty severe. Oh, yeah, especially the UK, the 15-year rule. I mean, it, it's funny how you can dodge this tax over here and run smack bang into another tax over here. 
And, you know, sometimes the DTA can help you. Spain, for example, if you're drawing a column of government superannuation pension, there's yep. actually there's actually exemptions to live yep. in Spain and draw that tax-free. Um, unfortunately, there's not as many DTAs in, in Europe as people think there are. You know, Greece, there's known, and that's another popular destination, so there is no DTA there. They are negotiating it right now. But um, I think it's one of the, you know, coming back to your point about people wanting a base, you know, to essentially travel the world but not pay tax, we're seeing more and more people moving to the UAE Mm. Uh, and using this as a retirement base. Now, the catch with it is, is it expensive to live here? No different to Australia. The, mm. cat, the catch is more, say, health insurance, which is incredibly expensive and something that the UAE government has to get, you know, a, a long-term solution there if they do want this place to be deemed as a as a tax, um, sorry, retirement destination. But people mm. are now finding they can base themselves here, they can spend more time here during the winter here, which is like a Gold Coast winter. It's actually a beautiful place to be. Get the hell out of Dodge in summer, spend that in Europe. But then you come into that situation of, are you making a rod for your own back? And one client the other day, I said to him, I said, you know what? Because super's not taxed in pension phase, you're better off being an Australian tax resident and then travel overseas for less than six months of the year. So yep. find some destinations in Oz for six months of the year and then bounce mm-hmm. yourself around. There will be certain conditions that attach to that in terms of like Europe, for example, there's the 90-day rule. I'm sure a lot of other countries have those similar sort of time frames. But you can be a digital nomad, sorry, you can be a nomad in a digital sense uh, and not have to worry about residency because as the ATO says, if you are a tax resident of nowhere, you default to being a tax resident of Australia. And that's not yep. a bad thing in retirement. During employment, it's the worst thing. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And I um, and I mean, we, we've talked about it on previous episodes where that consultation period, it, it draws an end tomorrow on the um, yep. updating residency or modernising residency. So we've submitted, um, obviously, our paper uh, and... Um, it's quite long and I think we put it out to a lot of our clients as well. So if you are looking to get a copy, um, Brett will obviously put the link in the show notes. Um, but, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see actually what comes from that. Um, I, I think naturally given all the feedback that, that they'll be receiving, I think they'll have to increase the 45 day rule. I just think everyone is just looking at that. I think it'll need to go to 60 days or 90 days, but we've talked about it at nauseam before, so probably won't talk about it too much here. But one thing you mentioned there about sort of, you know, being a nomad but basing yourself out of Australia, I think a lot of expats that are looking to have that kind of flexibility where they base themselves out of Australia but still have the opportunity to travel, maybe back to their current home country, that foreign country, they'll want that. But at least they can lean on Medicare back in Mm -hmm. Australia. Private health insurance is probably a lot more affordable. Um, And it's probably going to be a little bit easier for them to manage their assets when they're sort of managing it from one place, but maybe they've got one bank account left in the other uh, domicile. And then, you know, they've still got a bit of a footprint there. So ideally they can get a rental or, you know, Airbnb, whatever it might be, short-term rentals, and they base themselves out of there. I've spoken with clients which have returned either to the Gold Coast or um, I suppose the Sunshine Coast or down in Sydney, Melbourne. And a lot of them love the idea and the concept of having sort of, I suppose a European summer and then coming back to Australia and doing that for the first five to 10 years or as long as is feasible in retirement and then just setting and basing themselves out of Australia uh, once they sort of lose that interest and probably not as mobile as we get a little bit older. So I think that's going to be definitely a common theme as time gets on. The other one too that we're coming and seeing more and more of is government employees who are retiring and they're, the penny's finally dropping because they go to turn on their pension you know, as a government employee, and they're paying tax. Now, there's that offset if you're a tax resident of Australia, but if you're a non-resident, there's no offset. So we're meeting more and more people who, because to explain to folks out there, if it's a PSSAP or PSSS, sorry, PSS, um, mm-hmm. the old forms of government pensions in, in, in Canberra and around the traps, they are not taxed at 15% on contributions. Essentially, they accumulate tax-free and then the government takes or the mm. ATA takes their pound of flesh like the UK system. So I was talking to a gentleman the other day, he's looking to retire to France. 
Um, and he's like, what do you mean I've got to pay 32.5% tax on this income? It's like, well, because you're a non-resident, it's accessible income. And in yep. Australia, there's a there's a tax offset that you're a non-resident. So there are complicating factors there. So we're looking at strategies to draw as a lump sum out, roll it into a um, uh, retail super account, pay the tax. But then mm-hmm. once he's paid it today, he's not paying it on 10 or 20 year balances, um, which yeah. will save him a lot of money. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to, to skin it. And, and just because you're talking to someone who's retiring to Thailand, don't assume it just works the same as someone retiring to France or United States or the UK. It's important that you get those details finalized in that jurisdiction because mm. it can take a, a holiday dream or a, a wish that you've had for a very many years of having a uh, you know, nice little country villa down in um, you know in the south of France to being a nightmare for you. So do the numbers, make sure you get appropriate advice. It, it comes back to um, being forewarned as forearmed and uh, making informed decisions. Absolutely, mate. And I think uh, that's probably a really good part to um, wind up to today's episode. Yep. I mean, it's it's a complicated area and either way, having a really good understanding of how your current jurisdiction might tax that it is obviously just educating yourself. And it just means you can also firm up on your overall strategy when it comes yep. time to retirement. You know, if you're retiring and then you're starting to plan for retirement, you've left it way too late. You know, you should be well and, and truly planning, you know, five to 10 years out before retirement. So you're giving yourself plenty of, I suppose, runway to squash assets in certain vehicles such as super um, and then pay off debt, consolidation events, all those sort of things. Um, and I totally agree. We're doing that right now with a the client. They've collected assets like baseball cards. And um, I said, when you cross the threshold of retirement, you you don't realize it yet, but your attitude towards risk and the management of that will suddenly shrink dramatically. You won't want yeah. debt. You want things nice and simple. You want to switch off. You're not going to want to go into a debt environment. Yeah, sorry, retirement environment with all this debt and dealing with so many different issues. You just want to focus on you. You know, for the last 30, 40 years of your career, you focused on everything else, raising your family and, and providing for them and and, um, and also to working. Uh, but in retirement, it should be about you and, and your significant other if you've got one. So uh, um, that's our experience anyway. We see it all the time. You know, people can look yeah. you in the face and say, no, no, I'm going to want all this. And I say, don't build Rome because I guarantee it five years into retirement, you're just going to tear it down again. Yep. hundred percent agree. Yep. So, right, mate. Well, let's leave it there. We'll let the good folks get on with their day and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, mate.